It is my great honor and, and, and privilege to uh, moderate this panel of five uh, mm -hmm. exceptional uh, personalities and uh, thinkers on a topic that's been reverberating for uh, the last two years and that uh, is uh, also a part of our uh, collective memory in uh, this uh, country. Uh, there is a popular misconception about transitions. Uh, if you read the media and uh, what politicians have to say about transitions, that they invariably speak of uh, orderly, stable, uh, smooth uh, transitions. Uh, in my mind, there are no such things. Uh, a transition, a big social change that uh, we mean when we speak of social transitions is intrinsically messy. It's a, a messy process because it moves the whole society from one state of uh, equilibrium to another state of equilibrium. There are many challenges and obstacles along the way. Uh, parts of the process are unpredictable and parts of the process may be uh, uncontrollable. And it may be for this reason that we sometimes think of uh, 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 of democracy as a, uh, as a rather good system to cope with uh, transitions, because uh, uh, democracy, again, by definition, is not a stable state of affairs. It's a process of permanent transition, uh, albeit uh, uh, small transitions. It's a process of what is sometimes called a dynamic equilibrium. And uh, so it, uh, it's capable of absorbing the changes uh, without uh, risks of uh, uh, the kind that we invariably witness in uh, radical transitions from one political system to another, from uh, one state to another. Uh, we have uh, sort of four questions for the panel, and they the practical questions. One uh, regards the speed. Uh, is uh, 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 the success of a transition in any way related to its speed? Should the uh, Big Bang radical kind of uh, transition be preferred to a more deliberate uh, pace, or is there no relationship? Uh, at all. The second question is uh, uh, about the program of, of transition. Should the program be broad uh, so as to uh, solicit as much of uh, a popular consensus uh, uh, of the largest number of people as possible, or should it be uh, more radical and more narrow at uh, the risk of alienating some of the population. Uh, the third question regards uh, external uh, uh, factors. Are external factors foreign aid, uh, foreign assistance, political support, uh, uh, are they conducive to a successful uh, transition or do they pose uh, uh, risks of uh, themselves uh, in that uh, uh, the people in the country involved may see the process of transition as, uh, as imported, as foreign, as not uh, uh, indigenous to uh, the country itself. So uh, how open should we be about uh, supporting transitions uh, and how careful should we be? And the last but not least question is about transitional justice, about the 
as we sometimes said in, the, in this country about the size of the rear view mirror, should we concentrate on, on the past and on questions of uh, justice regarding the past at the risk of becoming uh, obsessed uh, uh, with the process or should we, uh, should we prefer to draw the line behind the past at the risk of, uh, of making people feel there is no justice and of, uh, of repeating some of the same mistakes. So these are my questions for the panel. I will give each of the panelists seven to eight minutes to respond to the question. Then I'll try to mix things up a little to liven up the discussion and then we'll throw it open uh, to the floor. My first speaker uh, is my uh, uh, friend and uh, colleague for the last 25 years, uh, my boss for uh, the last uh, three years and again before that and maybe again in the future. Uh, and uh, you know uh, all about him, it's all in the materials. Uh, he was the foreign minister of this uh, country. He was the chancellor to the first office of uh, uh, President Havel. Many other things that you all know about him. One thing that you may not know about him, he's the, he's the only person that I know uh, who when listening to a very important speech can fall asleep and still not lose a beat. He will always applaud at the right time. I, I've been trying for 20 years to learn that from him in vain. Kara Schwarzenberg. <laughs> Risks of, of transition. Uh, let, uh, let's first look maybe at the words, which are essential in this context. Uh, transition comes from transira, transira, to go over, to cross over. And uh, this uh, revolution comes uh, from the word revolver, turn around. And um, what are the risks if we start a revolution a turn around if we don't uh, take good care, and as so often happened, it that people with great fervor and urgency uh, turned around and turned it so much that we are looking exactly in the same direction as they were before and marching on in the same direction as they did before, but we're sure that they are entering a new road. Uh, that's one of the risks. If a revolution, if a transition uh, should be successful, it would be useful if at the beginning those people who are starting to move would think what they wish to achieve, what will be the end, uh, end of the development, uh, which means we have. Sometimes that exactly happened to us uh, 24 years ago, to tell the truth, nobody expected, still in the mid-80s, that in our countries soon democracy will start. Uh, and sun suddenly the Soviet empire ended with the implosion, and we all got free, but nobody believed before, and nobody was prepared. Uh, so the transition in our countries start not so well prepared. And nobody of the actors knew exactly where we are going, what we will achieve. We had the vague idea of democracy. We had the vague idea we would like to be like, similar to Western Europe or to the United States. Uh, but that was about all. And of course, therefore, uh, there was a lot of mistakes. And uh, that, as a rule, in many revolutions, people who start the revolution are the first who are eaten by it. Uh, that was a development we know well of the French Revolution, 
that those who started the beginning of it, they were liberated and disappeared, and radicals ended it. And we have the same what we see now in the Arab states, that those liberal thinking people those who thought they can change the fate of their country uh, towards a liberal and democratic and free uh, development, suddenly realize that nobody knows anymore where the movement will end. So it knew it's uh, really great consistency and to be real, really realistic in the transition. Many of us in our countries thought already that in uh, a few years we have achieved our aim and the future of our countries will be a democratic dream in liberty. And only a few years later we realized that democracy and liberty is endangered the whole time. And still today, we have forces in our countries and other countries too, who are fighting the liberty, who don't like genuine democracy. So uh, I think consistency and a clear mind is a precondition of a successful transition. So as always, what is against this danger of transition? We, ourselves, if we don't take care, if we are not realistic, if we are over-optimistic, if we don't see what this is, that policy is always essentially a game about power. And if we lose the power, all the transition will go exactly the other way that we thought. Uh, but I do think all people who fight now for democracy in Arab states and other countries should be much more realistic. We were too little realistic, and some, in some countries, we pay for this development still today. That's the really danger we have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kari. Uh, our <clears throat> next speaker is uh, also a uh, man that uh, you are familiar with from these uh, meetings and from many other occasions, and I'm very happy to say he's also a friend. And uh, Shlomo Avineri mm. is, uh, you know, one of the foremost uh, scholars of uh, political science uh, in this generation, at least in my mind. Uh, he's... Uh, a very prolific author of, uh, he's written on Marx, on Hegel, on Zionism, uh, many other subjects he's taught at, uh, and still teaches at a number of uh, leading universities. And uh, uh, last but not least, he's also a colleague because having been the Director General of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs for a time, he. Uh, he has practical experience with uh, diplomacy. Shlomo. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, first of all, I want to agree with your opening statement that transitions are messy. The question is, is the transition messy or is the outcome messy? And we see countries where the transitions are messy, the outcome is more or less normal uh, or good, we see other countries where the mess goes on and on and on. And in order to consolidate the four questions, I want to, be, because this is in Prague, I want just to say something very briefly about what happened to transitions in this area and east of it. When we say transitions, we in a way presume that this is a transition to an outcome that we expect and more or less we know what it is going to be. And my main argument is going to be that, well, those are transitions, but we do not always know transitions to what. 20 years ago, 23 years ago, all communist regimes in this region collapsed. And they were not identical, but they were very similar. One party state, state control of the economy in different ways, state control of education, suppression of religion in different ways, control of media. 
And the common view at that time, perhaps epitomized more than by somebody like Fukuyama, was this is not only the end of history, but we know where it's going. 20, 23 years later, we see great differences. We see differences between Visegrad countries on one hand, the Baltics on the other hand, and we see Russia and Ukraine, never mind the Central Asian republics, which go somewhere else. So the fact that the countries were very similar 23 years ago doesn't suggest that the conditions were the same because they were not. And when we want to see the background for the differences, we have to relate to two sets of questions. One has to do with the past and one has to do with the future. The question with the past is, with what burden do countries come to what we call now transitions? What were the histories? What were the traditions of civil society, uh, of economic activity, of academic freedom, of tolerance, of pluralism in those societies even before the emergence of dictatorship, be they communist or others. And we have seen in this area that countries that did have either a democratic history like Czechoslovakia or at least democratic institutions like uh, Poland and Hungary uh, in different ways, no, not, not problematic, but there were tra tra traditions of representations, of relative pluralism. Those countries have a better chance uh, of developing uh, a, a transition to a consolidated democracy. In countries like Russia or Ukraine, where the those elements were not there, uh, the development went in other directions. If the tradition was always very authoritarian, as, as it has unfortunately been in Russia, uh, we see new authoritarian developments. Mm. And I think this is something that one has to look in the Middle East. And I want to say it very carefully about our neighbor Egypt. Uh, I think we all were enthusiastic when we saw what happened in Tahrir Square, but we also know, what some of us know, that not all of Egypt was at Tahrir Square. And not all of Egypt looks and lives and thinks like Tahrir Square. And therefore, the outcome of the elections was slightly different. And when we look today at the trials of Egypt, uh, we see a situation in which, when historically, the two strongest groups in society, or the two strongest elements in society, are on one hand an army, which has not only been in power in Egypt, but historically, from the times of Muhammad Ali, has been identified with modernizing Egypt, with an Egyptian view of progress, an Egyptian view of secularism. This is a very strong social organization. And on the other hand, you have the Muslim Brotherhood, might have been banned politically, but it had its social network, and it is the strongest social network in the country. When you have those two elements being the strongest elements in society, the development towards just through elections through a demo, to a democratic consolidated structure is problematic. And I think we see the problems today. And when you look at a country like Syria, which is very different from Egypt because Egypt is a historical entity, Syria is not. Syria and its present boundaries were set up by British imperialists, Sykes-Picot, as we say in the Middle Eastern jargon. Its borders were drawn without considering geography, history, tradition, religion, anything. Uh, the outcome has to do also with the question, can Syria maintain itself as a political entity after what is happening now, or will it break up the way Iraq has broken up, the way Sudan has broken up, and the way Libya has difficulty setting up a coherent government because Libya was never an entity except under Ital Italian occupation. So the history, to looking to history, we either find the building blocks or the lack of them. <coughs> and we have to study the history of those countries very carefully and therefore they are so very, very different. Even within Visegrad, we know the differences that have to do with history. And the other issue is the future. Um, when autocratic regimes break down, and they break down out of a, either revolt or mass demonstrations, what happened in Central Eastern Europe, and also what happened in, uh, in, in Egypt, there is a great hope. And because of the, the, the hope is so very well articulated by usually liberal, usually secular, well-educated people, we tend to think that the hope by itself, 
is enough. And therefore, there are illusions. There were illusions about Russia after uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and there were illusions about Egypt. And there were illusions even about a country like Syria when the demonstration started. And one of the great dangers is that we take those illusions about the futures for realities and do not <coughs> correlate them with the realities and what we know about history. So what I suggest is that we should, in every case, study the history and the historical forces and the historical potentialities of things that are perhaps not democratic but can be a building block for democratic development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shlomo. A, a, a lot of food for thought. Uh, Grigory Yavlinsky is... Uh, I don't know if you've ever missed a forum. I, you, you must have been here at all of them. About. He's certainly one of the About. most familiar faces in, in this gathering, and uh, so my introduction will once again be short. Uh, Grigory is an economist and a politician. He was the founder of the Yabloko movement, uh, a member of the Duma, a candidate for the Russian presidency, and uh, uh, currently he's a Professor of uh, Economics, Gregory. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here, and I'm very thankful for invitation to see you and to speak to you. I would start uh, with uh, some quoting of uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He was asked once by Margaret Thatcher, what about transition in Russia? And he responded that if to speak in one word, then it is good. If to speak in many words, no good. <laughs> uh, I think it's a detailed explanation of what's going on. Because it's a very big number of risks, and it is absolutely not clear where the transition is heading. Uh, and uh, that is the reality. But this reality is rooted, at the, as it was mentioned uh, just now, not only in historical uh, roots in Russia and uh, historical cycles and different historical explanations, but uh, from my point of view, it is much more rooted in the way how the reforms were realized in Russia. And I want to present you, especially prepared for that forum and for you, some lessons from Russian reform, because it's a very big reform, uh, some lessons which must be very useful for, from my point of view, for all other kind of reforms, uh, almost in, in any country, which uh, we should understand in terms of risks of transition. The first lesson is that the main goal of the reform is not the budget constraints, not the free prices, and so on, but the main goal of the reform is the mentality of the society. This is the goal. Uh, because through, you, should, you should influence on this mentality in order to reach reforms which are deep, irreversible, and effective. But for that, you need to use the instruments like incentives, values, motives, and finally, to find the way to create the institutions. Mentality is the first goal. It's the lesson number one. The lesson <coughs> number two, it is necessary <coughs> to avoid by all means during the reforms splitting the society. The reformers by nature must be the integrators, not those who are making dividing lines in the society. Otherwise, as you know, the reforms would be reversible. No doubt about that. It would be the revenge 
So uh, you must be the integrator. The third lesson which we were suffering from our life is that there is no prepared decisions how to make the reforms, how to make the reforms. Not abroad, not in our history, <coughs> anywhere. So it's really, really necessary to create and to think and to try to realize new approaches because you can't find the, the already prepared models or, or recipes how to make the reforms. You can find the prepared recipes about the goals of reform, but it is not possible to create, uh, to find the recipes how to make them. The fourth lesson is, and it is asked in the questions, uh, about the speed. Our lesson, our outcome from our reformers, that speed is not important. The deepness and irreversibility this is what's important. The hysteria about speed can't be justified because you, you are trying to make reforms very speedy and then you would have a setback. So it's a different thing. You must always have a criteria of different type, how deep and how irreversible they are. Um, it's very important, and this is the fifth lesson, that reforms, real reforms, it's not a military battle. It's more like a peace negotiations with the society on the subject. If you are going to attack the society, you would never have the reforms which would be helpful. And the last but not least, reform is kind of an art. Not everybody can do that. To be a reformer means to be an artist. That's, that's <coughs> our conclusion. We have no, until today, that kind of artists. And here I'm coming to the last question. What about the foreign aid and foreign support for the reform? Definitely there is a real, uh, very important influence can be from abroad, but only in why, one way, as an example. Don't interfere, simply show the example that you know how to do this and that, <laughs> that you are better, that you are less lying, that you have less corruption, that you have more dignity to the people, that your people are more happy, and that's it. This is the main help in the reform. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gregory. This was wonderful. On my right side, we have our junior wing. Uh, Igor Blažević is uh, also uh, uh, in terms of the Forum 2000. He's not uh, a, a junior wing at all. Uh, he's been around for some time. He's a founder of the One World uh, Film Festival that uh, is, uh, I think, one of the best, if not the best, uh, film festivals on human rights uh, anywhere. He was the director on human rights for the Forum uh, for the People in Need Foundation. And uh, he's uh, currently involved in Barma. So, Igor, your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that, let's say, starting with a question about risks of the transition, uh, we have a pretty good knowledge about the risks. And uh, <coughs> we know how it's risky, how it is risky. We know it's a long way. Uh, we know, as it was said, that it was uh, chaotic. We know, let's say, that it starts and then goes in other directions, goes back, goes on the side, and so on. So, so, so we know that. But the second thing, let's say, when uh, things start to happen, 
I say, like in Egypt or like in Ukraine and so on. Then we have a, such a strong tendency to forget very quickly. Right? And we become overexcited, we become uh, over-optimistic, I say we become very, very emotional, and the worst thing, we become uh, triumphalistic. And then we become blind, and uh, we make a lot of uh, mistakes. The second thing, let's say, when I say we, I mean, let's say, us living in a, in a liberal, uh, liberal democracies which are better off. What about people who are living under the authoritarianism? Do they know how risky it is? Do they know how hard it is? Uh, usually they don't. There are some intellectuals, let's say, some, let's say, people who have a little bit of knowledge how risky it is. But most of the people, and most of the people who will be the driving force of the change, they do not really know let's say, how risky, how hard uh, it is. And they don't know it for the, for the two reasons, let's say. One reason is uh, 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 under the authoritarian system, the doors have been shut let's say, for the discussion about the change. Let's say. So, so they didn't have a real opportunity, let's say, to, to, to think about these things. And the other thing, even more important, they simply have the hopes in that particular moment. They have these deep frustrations. They have this uh, uh, deep anger. Let's say. And so in a moment, let's say, when it seems that change can happen, let's say, people basically have a tendency, let's say, to, to, to jump, jump on it. Uh, so now, let's say, what we should do, let's say, when we know what are the risks? Should we cut, come to those people, let's say, who have these hopes and say, oh, no, no, let's say, you are still not mature. Let's say, we look, our political science tells us, let's say, that your conditions are, are wrong. Let's say that you still need to wait, let's say. I think this is now the danger, let's say, because of all the troubles which we have in a, or tragic things which we have in, a, in a Syria. I have gone through that in a Bosnia, so, 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 so I know what I'm talking about. Let's say, I have gone through this tra uh, 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 tragedy, let's say. Should we now, let's say, because of these things, let's say, come, let's say, to the people who are from bottom up, pressuring and asking, let's say, the, 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 the representation, asking to have a say, let's say, to say, no, 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 wait a little bit. I really think we should not do, we should not do it. Let's say we should not go back in a, this false argument of the sequencing because it's a, it's a totally false argument, let's say. Let's say this argument, let's do a little bit, let's say, institution building, let's do with the benevolent good dictatorships, let's do a little bit, let's say, economic development, and then later on you can democratize. I think the profound thing to understand, let's say, if there are no good conditions for the democratizations, that means that same bad conditions are also creating a bad dictatorships. Let's say. And that bad conditions will create the bad dictatorships and that bad dictatorships will create even worse, let's say, conditions. So for that reason, I think in this particular time, let's say, yes, there is a lot of tr trouble around there. For that reason, we should very firmly let's say, as a liberal democracies, stand by those people, let's say, who are liberals, who are Democrats, who are human rights activists, let's say, who are out there and who might look defeated now, let's say. But our colleagues in Poland and my friends in Czech also look defeated in, a, in, a, in, a, in a 81. It looked pretty, pretty desperately hopeless. Did we in that moment or did you or did others give up on them because they looked so desperately defeated? <coughs> and then we, did we tell to them, oh, sorry, you should wait for the better condi conditions? No, we have stubbornly, firmly stand by them. And that is what I think what we exactly need to do, let's say. We even in a time, because exactly because it's so hard, because it's so dangerous, it's so full of risky, we should firmly, stubbornly uh, 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 stand by the Demo Democrats and liberals who are now uh, in a, all these troubled places around the world. One point. Another point, and this is something what I'm repeating myself again and again, but I need because things is not happening. I think that we really need, let's say, the people who have gone through the transition experience 
in a countries like Brazil, like South Africa, like, for example, my friends from the Croatia and new EU member states, they should also, let's say, go to these trouble spots where we are still struggling for freedoms, and they need to share their experience, let's say. The, the Germans and Americans, they have excellent, excellent professors, political science professors, they can give us a good lessons, but we really need the people who have gone through these experiences relatively recently, let's say, to come and to share, and as, as it was said, let's say, not to lecture, let's say, not to, but really to listen, let's say, to share their experience, to build the friendship, and to stand by those people who are now on the front line of the, of the, of the fight for the, for, 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 for the freedom and for the rights, and stand by exactly because the hearts are, times are hard. Uh, Last thing, what I wanted to say, let's say we need to pay the due attention to the Syria, to the Egypt, to the, to the, to the, to the uh, Middle East and so on, because it is urgent now. But by paying due attention to that, we should not lose kind of the big picture. Let's say I'm now working in Asia. There is in Asia quite a number of the countries which have pretty good conditions for the democratization. Let's say. And we should stand by also the Democrats and liberals there, let's say, to help them do the job. In Asia, we also have a number of countries which have partly <coughs> good conditions, partly bad conditions. So they need our help. And we have my Burma, let's say, which has all bad conditions. Let's say. And for that reason, what we are doing now in Burma, we are playing on a card of the regime. Let's say, instead of, let's say, standing firmly further on behind the democratic opposition in, in, in Burma, let's say. So I think, let's say, that uh, this is the last thing where I wanted to warn, let's say, let's focus on the Middle East, but the next wave is coming in, a, in, a, in a Asia, so we should be prepared for that. Let's say next big waves are coming in China and Russia, and that's, let's say, where it is important also to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, for that, uh, for making a passionate case for involvement. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, a colleague from one of the countries in uh, uh, question. Tarek Osman is, uh, is an Egyptian author, analyst, uh, economist, uh, before the events in Egypt, he wrote uh, a, a very popular uh, work, uh, Egypt on the Brink. Uh, now it sometimes seems that Egypt is over the brink, but uh, uh, Tarek. Sure. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to be here. Let me just qualify by two points. Uh, one is that I will only talk about the Arab world, which is the part I claim to know something about. So it will be a specific few points. And two, I think that there are so many risks in, in the transitions in the Arab world right now. So what I will try to put forward in front of you are a number of risks that I will categorize under four headings. This is certainly not the entire picture, but in my view, some of the, of the more interesting ones, and hopefully they will um, raise some ideas with you. The first set are under the, the usual boring politics. And everybody keeps talking about uh, transitions in the Arab world in terms of when will the elections take place in certain country, which uh, power will come forward, the Islamists or the secularists, and, and all of that. And I think there are a number of prerequisites that many countries in the Arab world have not really discussed or found some sort of a solution for, for at least 100 years, if not more. The first one of them is identity. If you go to a place like Egypt today, and the very simple question that you find people debating is, is Egypt an Islamic country? Is it a Mediterranean country? Is it an Arab country? And unfortunately, so far, most of the answers are exclusive. So you would not find people saying, well, we can be all of these things. Well, it's always, no, it has to be this or that. And I know that many political scientists keep saying that, um, these questions are irrelevant, and we need to focus on the tangible aspects of transition, which means parliamentary elections, constitutions, presidential elections, blah, blah, blah. 
fair enough, but I think however the theory says when you actually are on the ground talking to people, these fundamental questions pop up. And I think one of the key lessons of the past year in Egypt specifically, under the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood, I would argue in Syria as well, if you look at the interaction between the opposition, the political opposition, and the armed groups, it boils down, in my view, to the identity question. So I think that's a very interesting point that needs to be put forward. I'll try to move forward because I have a number of points I want to, to present to you. The second risk, in my view, in the Arab world especially, is what I refer to as viability. And I know that Shlomo had an article very recently about something very similar. Personally, I think there are some countries in the Arab world that has always or have always been there, and they will continue to be there. So they are going through turbulences right now, ups and downs. But if I close my eye and open it in 50 years, I know they will continue to be there. Egypt is one of them. Morocco is one of them. And I think it's very important in this case to keep in mind that the transition, even if it was very messy, it is a transition into probably a better future. But I think there are countries in the Arab world, I will not mention names so that I don't get uh, hurt by some people getting outside, but I think some countries in the Arab world most likely will not exist, maybe in 10 years down the line. Why this is, and especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think why this is important, because it means that if you are going towards transition, that the decision maker in these countries or the elites of that country do know they are not transitioned towards something, but they are transitioned towards nothing, transitions to extinction, then of course they will resist the transition. It's ex transition towards elimination, if you'd like, of the, of the exact country itself. Shlomo referred to the sachs pico agreement. For those who don't know, this is basically the division of the Middle East between the, the Brits and the French after the First World War. And I think over this century, many countries have been there just to serve some purposes, botches and pieces. But again, probably many of these will not exist, which means that the transitions here are not transitions toward a better future or a worse future. It's a transition toward something entirely different. A third point, and I'll stop after this on the politics, is the role of religion, which I think has always been there probably in Latin America, an area I don't know much about, but I would argue probably much more than it has been in your part of the world. I think in the Arab world, the role of religion is fundamental in the political transition, and by that usually people refer to Islamization full stop. Do not exclude the Christianization, for example, that has happened in many countries, including Egypt, the role of the church, for example, in Egypt is paramount. In Lebanon, the role of the Maronite church is paramount in politics. So my point is the role of religion in the Arab world, whether it's Islamic, and in Islamic you can go into Sunni, Shia, and becomes very nice or boring, it depends, or Christianization, the role of religion is extremely fundamental, I think, to understanding politics in, in the Middle East. To move very quickly, on the economic side, most people as well look at transitions from the prism of economic reform, usually the IMF consensus. And I agree, this is, this is a fundamental point. If you look at, at Egypt or Morocco or Jordan, something like one third of the budgets in these countries are devoted to subsidized fuel and food. Obviously unsustainable and obviously leads to severe, severe underinvestment in everything else, especially education. So obviously it's the elephant in the room. But the one point I would like to put forward in front of you as a, in my view, huge risk in economic terms in the Arab world is competitiveness. I think that most of the Arab world, if not the entire Arab world, has severe problem with competitiveness in the job market right now. And if you keep in mind the, the simple truth that when I was born, the Arab world was roughly 180, 190 million people. Today, 37 years later, it is above 330 million people. So it effectively, effectively almost doubled. Now, within this new 180 million people, two-thirds of them are teens, are in their 15s and 16s and 17s. So they are going supposedly to want to have a job, and a job that's sustainable, not just to be on the streets of Cairo waiting to be a laborer for a day and get $10 for that day and hopefully survive on it for three days. They need sustainable jobs. If the vast amount, if not all, but the vast amount of that huge segment is uncompetitive 
and they are very young, then obviously you have trouble. I was talking yesterday in a small workshop and I drew attention to the work of a fantastic scholar. Her name is Diane Singerman, who referred to this as the demographic bomb in the Arab world. And I think it is probably worth thinking about that. It can be a demographic dividend, as somebody mentioned yesterday. It can also be a demographic bomb. And I think competitiveness here is, in my humble view, the key word. To move quickly, on the social side, I think there are three points to keep in mind. One is that probably with the, with the entire Arab world, probably, maybe Lebanon is an exception, but probably with the entire Arab world, the Arab world has always had top-down politics. So there's always a strong man or a strong institution, being the church, being the, the mosque, being the tribal leader, whatever, that has been disseminating ideas and convincing the people and they come after him. And it's always him, not her. Over the past two and a half years, I think we are seeing for the first time, probably in the history of the Arab world, probably ever, bottom-up politics. And I think it's happening elsewhere, not just in the Arab world. We've seen what happened in Turkey, what happened in Brazil. But this bottom-up, in a very fluid situation, can be potentially also very disruptive. The second point is that I think the Arab world has historically failed to have any type of inclusive mentality, unfortunately. We have always had some sort of an idea. For example, when Muhammad Ali, which somebody referred to, Muhammad Ali created Egypt, this is the founder of modern Egypt. It was some sort of an Ottoman dream under his family. Later on, the Arab liberal, lovely liberal experiment from the late 19th century to early 20th century when people tried to build Paris on the Nile and when the Arab world was having lovely literature and music and films and theater, it was the Arab world liberal, full stop, and everybody was marginalized. Then came Arab nationalism under Nasser and the likes, and it was, it's Arabism, and everybody else is marginalized. The Islamists suffered a lot during that time. And then we have, even after that, later on, the Muslims come into power, the Islamists, and they marginalize everybody else. And right now, they are being marginalized. And I think it is very sad truth that we have never managed to have some sort of real, not just rhetoric, real inclusiveness in the Arab world. And I think it is a fundamental social problem. A final point on the, generational, uh, in, on the social element is the generational point. I mentioned before that in the Arab world, roughly half of the population, if not more, is under 30, two-thirds of those in their teens, but every single decision maker in the Arab world now belongs probably to the two major entrenched powers exactly. in the Arab world, either the military or the monarchies, nothing else, which means that there's a huge detachment, huge, between those who make decisions across the Arab world and the vast, 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 vast majority of people. And the final point, and then I'll stop, which is the regional dynamics. I think, as they say in French, uh, look at la, la, for, la force de l'argent, it's the power of money at the end of the day that has the most powerful impact on the ground. Money in the Arab world rests in few countries without mentioning names, and I think these few countries, most of them are in the Gulf, easy to guess, have intrinsic interest, strong interest to stop the wave of representation that is appearing in different parts of the world, especially if that wave of representation has some sort of consistency, some sort of agreement with Islamization. If these two more or less come together in a workable formula, Islamization or Islamic frame of reference with some sort of representation democracy, then some very rich and powerful players in the Gulf will be really in trouble. What I'm trying to say is there are very rich power centers in the Arab world that have been actively trying to stop this wave of representation coming from the Middle East, which is a huge problem, I would argue. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, you certainly cover a lot of ground in eight minutes. You certainly seem to cover a lot of ground in eight minutes. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you all. Uh, I will now revert to the panel, but uh, in order to have some, some debate, let me try to point out a few areas of possible debate or even uh, disagreement in what uh, has been said. Uh, first of all, and this goes a little beyond the scope of this, uh, uh, Karel Schwarzenberg uh, uh, spoke about uh, the greatest enemy of transitions uh, uh, being uh, us. Uh, 
as, as they say, we have found the enemy and the enemy is us. Uh, it's, uh, it points to a, a problem that is rarely discussed. We, when we think of transitions, we think of uh, transitions to some kind of an end state, a, a desirable end state, and some countries, some people, the good students like us, they make it to the end state and some fail and have to try again, uh, maybe 10 years or 15 years later, uh, but the end state remains the same. The problem is that there may be no end states, that uh, as in every social and physical process, there are uh, there are two processes going on simultaneously, the process of uh, evolution and the process of decay. And even uh, systems that are far advanced, like liberal democracies, sometimes uh, uh, register the signs of decay. And in Europe these days, uh, uh, and in our part of Europe too, uh, you may see some uh, signs of that. And you could argue that uh, uh, the risks are already hidden in the transitions that preceded them, in the imperfections, inconsistencies. Uh, uh, and so my, my question to the panelists would be, what are the danger signs that we should be looking for, not in Syria, not in Egypt, uh, but in the Czech Republic, France, the United States, and countries we usually don't uh, discuss in this, uh, in this context. The second question regards uh, speed. Uh, Grigory, you said speed is not important. It is the sorrowness of the reform, etc., etc. But uh, it seems to be an empirical fact that uh, uh, that the success of reforms depends on the popular support of the population which is limited in terms of time and which if uh, the hardship goes on for too long uh, dissipates and then the uh, uh, reforms uh, flounder. And, uh, uh, and it seems to be the case that the relatively successful reforms, and I don't want to praise anyone or to criticize anyone, in our part of the world over the last 25 years were invariably those with, uh, uh, with the radical strategy and with the do it, uh, do it fast strategy, whereas uh, other reforms have not uh, fared so well. So that would be my second question. And, and the third area where we seem to have some uh, unclarity or disagreement is is about foreign involvement. You say, Grigory, that you know other countries should be only examples, not interfere. And Igor, if I understand him correctly, uh, is all in favor of of interfering. And even in the current transitions in the Middle East, you see this rather schizophrenic. Uh, uh, attitude of, of some countries which uh, call for a Marshall Plan to help the transitions along and at the same time say, but don't interfere. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, and again, in our experience, we relied a lot both in the pre-revolution era and after uh, the changes, we relied a lot on on, uh, on solidarity and support from, from abroad. So it's these three areas that uh, I would like to clarify and you can take uh, either one of them. And uh, Kari, you want to start? No, I started before now. Okay. The other way around. Mm -hmm. So Tarek, we'll start with you <laughs> and we will finish with, with Kari. Well, on the first one, I, I'm not going to answer because I don't know. You said basically the, uh, the risks in, in this country. Maybe the foreign, foreign involvement the okay. question would be the right for you. I mean, you notice from, from the, the number of risks that I put forward in front of you that for me the most 
important ones, you can all of them label somehow as social. From the identity, the viability, the inclusiveness, the demographics, the education, the competitiveness, all of these at the end of the day are socioeconomic. And if they are socioeconomic, then fundamentally they need to be solved slash answered by the people of the country or of the region, not necessarily by any international player. I, I'll pick on two points. I think one of them was men mentioned before about, uh, by Igor, I think, about some societies like yours who have went through arguably a very successful transition, whether they're able to share their experiences with the region I come from. And I agree, yes. I was having a similar chat yesterday with a gentleman here. Having said that, you need to keep in mind two things. One is that, and I'll put it bluntly and politically incorrectly, you're much more advanced than us. Uh, here, for example, the level of literacy is probably 100%. In the country I come from, it's arguably nothing more than 60%. Here, gender equality is not an issue. Half of Egyptian women have never worked before. So you have to keep in mind that the starting point is very different. The point I keep saying in terms of international intervention from that domain is that you probably have done some very successful stuff, whatever it is, in what is usually referred to as civil society, labor unions, uh, student unions, educational policies, uh, professional syndicates. Yes, and these things, we can learn some things from you. And I always think also they're not particularly linked to money, so they're not they're not a burden on, on Europe at a time when Europe is already not in the best financial shape. But the, the second point that I think from an international invent, intervention, if we take it forward, is that I'm an economist by training, and I spent many years as a banker, and I do believe in the power of money. In other words, I do believe in the idea that for it to be incentivize, incentivizing for you, it's not just because you're good guys and you want to help those uh, poor guys on the southern parts of the Mediterranean. You need to make money. You need to effectively have a real incentive, which has a word. It's called investment. It's called win-win. If there are opportunities that international players, be it American, be it European, whatever, <clears throat> in which they are able to identify in these parts of the world, that they are able to invest and make money and create opportunities for them, economic opportunities for them, that at the same time would have some sort of technology transfer, some sort of job opportunities creation, some sort of transfer even of work ethic in certain ways, I think this is a win-win. In my view, this is the best intervention, these two types. Thank you. Igor, and I failed to mention it's three minutes each so that we have, so that we people from the floor also have a chance. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, arguing for interventions, uh, and uh, I said, let's say, we should not be uh, triumphalistic, let's say, and uh, I think, let's say, that the changings in the countries are happening because, happening because of the domestic driving forces. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we should not uh, disengage from the, let's say, standing by the liberals and democrats in a places, let's say, where now it's a hard because we are starting, I see, I see it in a policy making, let's say, that we are now starting to shift in a mindset saying, oh, stable dictatorships are a little bit better than all this trouble what we have, let's say. So the things what I wanted to warn us is about, let's say, not switch, let's say, say oh, a little bit dictatorships is a better let's say, than what we have. But drive, domestic forces are the driving force, and I'm just saying we should be with them, let's say, and I said we should listen to them, we should not teach them. But by listening to them, let's say, we should share a little bit of our experiences, because from that dialogue, I believe, let's say, we are helping them, <coughs> and we are also helping us a little bit to understand what's going on around the world. Thank you, Igor. Gregory. Okay. Mm. First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, sp to, to tell you something about the speed. Yes, you were asking me about the speed. I want to remind you that one of the Chinese leaders uh, 40 or 50 years ago was asked what he thinks about the consequences of the French Revolution. And he responded that it's too early to say. Yeah? So that means that uh, 
the speed is not just only for, for now. It's a long story, um, uh, meaning that uh, uh, this is not only about the results today, but it's also about the absence of disappointments. Because in terms of transition, disappointments is the most dangerous thing. If you're taking a speed which is immediate, you can achieve something for one small group of people in the country. But you have such amount of disappointments that this disappointment would swallow the result which this group of people got it. And that will be the answer. Of course, faster better. But faster doesn't mean that you have a special schedule and you like train should go during this period of time. It'll be simply a disaster. You would divide the society, you would split it, and you would have a conflict at the end of the day. And now your second question. Uh, so speed is, is like in, in everything in life. For some people, that kind of speed is good. For the other country, that kind of speed is good. The speed is not the main criteria. That's what I want to say as a message. And the, your second question was about foreign aid. Foreign Two examples. One concept of foreign aid, Marshall Plan. The other concept of foreign aid, Washington Consensus. So this is two examples, one successful, and the other one, uh, speaking very softly, not very. <laughs> not very. That's why, generally speaking, show us the examples. Show us the way of living where democracy really works. Show us the, the way of living when you have a really free economy, you have a competition, you have a really private property rights, you have no <coughs> Abu Ghraib, you have no prisons in, the, in Europe, you have really freedom of speech, you, have, you are not watching your own citizens. When we have the information five times a day by all uh, television news about the things which I just declared, what kind of aid you can expect from that side? It's a big problem. So, Generally speaking, the best thing is uh, just to give the example. If you are also ready to give money unconditionally, it's okay. <laughs> and is it better to do example without money or money without example? It's better to give example. We would do our money ourselves, okay? <laughs> if okay. we would have the example. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, we would lose the way. That's the problem. Shlomo. <laughs> Briefly about speed and then the question of foreign involvement. I know one should never quote Machiavelli. It puts you in bad light. But Machiavelli did say, among other things, <laughs> that, among other things, that the prince, if he does good things, he should do them slowly. If he does bad things, he should do them quickly. And not <laughs> one thing after the other. So, I mean, the issue of speed uh, plays into this <laughs> hand. And reformers be good thing or bad thing? Good. That's it. Exactly. Now, on the issue of foreign involvement, two issues. First of all, it, again, there is no overall answer. In Central Eastern Europe, whatever the United States did in supporting reformers or supporting then reform politicians, was considered positive because the West and the United States was seen as a model that one would like to emulate. And therefore, one was looking to the United States, yeah. give us a good example. In the Middle East, it's a little bit more complicated. For historical reasons that I don't want to go into it, America is considered bad. And if uh, there is American support for anyone in the Middle East, he is dead on arrival, <laughs> whether it is the generals or even the Muslim Brotherhood. So one should, again, make distinctions. But there is, on the issue of foreign support, I think a conceptual issue. Let me take one example very briefly, secularism. Uh, in the West, it's considered that secularism is part of the Enlightenment project. It has to do with liberalization, with tolerance, uh, with uh, pluralism, uh, and eventually with liberal democracy. In the history of the Middle East, there were in the last hundred years a number of examples of secularization, but they were always authoritarian and coming from above. 
In Turkey, it was Atatürk who wants to force secularism uh, on a very traditional society. The Shah in Iran, Mubarak in Egypt in a gentle way, Assad in Syria in a very brutal way. All those dictators were identified with secularization. And that's something which people in the West not always realize, because for us, secularization means democratization. In the Middle East, secularization means dictatorship. And when you bring down a secular dictator and you have then democratic elections, what comes back is a return of the repressed. Today, Turkey is much more democratic than it was under Ataturk, but much more religious than it was under Ataturk. I hate to say good thing about Iran, but Iran today is a little bit more open than it was under the Shah, given the Islamic Republic, but it is more Islamicist and more religious. And the same was about to happen under the Muslim mm. Brotherhood in Egypt. And when Assad says that he stands for secularization, in a very convoluted way, he is right. And this is one of the paradoxical reasons why the Christian minority today in Syria supports Assad, a, a repressive dictator, because the alternative may be a Sunni Islamic fundamentalist regime. So one of the issues when you talk about Western influence or Western impact is to realize that when you use words which are of the European and Western background, one shouldn't impose the Eurocentric um, history on the Middle East because it is different. So what I repeat is one has to understand history and differences without trying to think there is one way which is, uh, Grisha, you said the French Revolution is early, the Chinese said maybe it's early, I don't know. It took France a hundred years until it was really institutionalized. <laughs> and the goal forced it by a non-democratic way and institutionalize it. So one has to be very careful at looking in a facile way at modern Western examples. After all, democracy in the West, in England and France, never mind Germany and Italy, took a very, very long time. So one should have the patience and not look at the European end result as, as, as if it is a given that can, you know, a deus ex machina, appear immediately in countries where issues like secularization are considered to be identified with authoritarianism and not with self-determination. Fascinating. Thank you, Shlomo. Now, <laughs> last word. Well, <laughs> if he, it was because good. he thinks, wait a moment. I do. That for the moment, foreign intervention is, has to be care, used very carefully. And there are, of course, different interventions. One, which is at some quarters popular, is an armed intervention, which, as a rule, has other disastrous results. Because you can change the character of a country by an armed intervention. But only in the condition you do it as the Allies in 45, that you occupy Germany and Japan and re-educate it. But you can't re-educate by bombs only and rockets and missiles. That one should acknowledge. So if you don't intend to occupy, you don't intend to expose your own soldiers, you should abstain from armed intervention. That's one thing. The, a civil and peaceful intervention, yes. And, of course, it, it has to be very careful because, I mean, it's, it's something which seems to us in, uh, in West as awful and it gives good cause for intervention. Maybe in this part of the world it's more looked like a, as, as a revival of colonialism. I think we have to study carefully the conditions in, in this country before we can coming uh, with, let's say, um, sanctions and other means. Just uh, totally peaceful uh, instruments should be used. It means uh, have sent books, it gives a chance, uh, the democratic uh, chance, 
uh, to speak a bit, at least in your country, in your media, support uh, democratic forces. This all can we do, but again, one should do it in a way which is um, acceptable in this country. Because as a rule, uh, countries which are difficult, which have regimes which are not very pleasant, are extremely nationalistic. That's at least the experience of the last 100 years. And, therefore, and this nationalism is shared not only by the regime, but by the other population too. So I think, again, we have to think twice uh, because before we really start to intervene. We, uh, in Europe here, think very often of our own experience, but basically uh, our Democrats, be it in Poland, in former Czechoslovakia, in all, all the countries of which were under Soviet bloc, shared, furthermore, the same experience, similar history with uh, Western Europe and, and, and had the same ideas and the same view as the countries don't. And that when one should always uh, take, take good care that not everybody shares, shares our idea and no, everybody thinks that our idea of arranging a state as a pluralistic democracy is a good idea. So I just think, yes, but intervention is like a medicine. Uh, it can help, but as Paracelsus taught us, uh, each medicine, if you use it too much, is a poison too. And uh, some, sometimes rather counterproductive. Thank you. Well, who will be the doctor? Uh, thank you. Well, I'm sure there, are, there will be questions. Please. Please wait for the mic. Uh, the gentleman over there. Well, thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, we are a small group of Cubans that for the first time we can uh, come to this kind of meeting. And it's a pleasure to be uh, uh, talking directly and not reading by newspaper or something like that. Well, my question, uh, my name is Antonio Rodiles. My question is related with uh, how we uh, see the process of transition. Because for sure, we, we are trying to move from one point A to one point B. But I think that one of the main mistakes that probably we are making is that we can see with a deterministic approach that process. We want to arrive to a point B with institution, rule of law, free election, and so on. But we need to analyze how we are going to fill in all these uh, elements. Because if we don't have the social structure, the social capital or the human capital, then we cannot fill that uh, elements in the society. Then I think that it's really, really important also to understand that one of the key points of the totalitarian system is to break the societies. To, to break completely in, you know, not only the society, even sometimes the individuals. Exactly. And then one of the point here, I think, is to start to glue all the elements, all the ingredients, and then to try to then make work. Probably we cannot understand which is going to be the end. We cannot predict the end. But if we have the right ingredients, I think we are going to move in the range that we want. Thank you. Because we're short on time, I'll take three questions and let the, let the panel react to them. I have two Slovak uh, friends uh, wanting to uh, pose a question, and since in this country is still a little sexist, uh, ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Coming uh, really from Slovakia as a country, as a success story in transition progress uh, some years ago as a tiger of uh, Visegrad 4 and being the only country having also euro currency in our pockets. Um, I want to ask you, there is a, another risk 
and there is a revolution of higher expectations. And this is something which could bring, after 20 years of transition, something which is going to destroy the democratic institutions uh, because the people want, uh, if, you, if you raise the really good and high expectations, then the people are starting to be impatient. They want to have the everything on the table now. And that's why we are now fa facing the huge negative atmosphere, and especially among young people in Slovakia. Six, more than 60% of young people in Slovakia want to go out of the country. What to do with this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify the question, do you, do you count the euro among the achievements or among the risks? Achievements. Achievements. Because we have this euro in our pockets, you don't. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I think the question still stands. Uh, Martin. Yes, your, your, your turn. I, I, I see you there in the back, too. Uh, I have a, does it work? I have a different question, maybe slightly provocative. Uh, we are talking here at the forum and during this day and pointing at the fact that the countries of Central Eastern Europe have or have had some preconditions. It means the modern, that's the way of modernization, social and human capital, education, and many, many other positive preconditions. But, but I think if we haven't had that possibility to be integrated in the broader uh, community of uh, Western democracies, it means EU, so it would be much more complicated for us. Now, my question is, to other countries which simply do not have a framework like this. And isn't it like this that could be a unifying consensus for those who really want and desire for a change, just this conviction that it's only us who can do it. There are no patterns. There isn't any foreign aid which could somehow be useful for us, but it is something what we should do. Uh, one example where even these countries did it, it was the Baltic resistance against the Soviet Empire. If there were no Lithuanians and the others, no one would do it instead of them. No Russians, no Western Europeans, no one. So it means, and I think Russia is an absolute example. I cannot imagine someone others than Russians and non-Russians living in Russia can make it. But isn't this something what can attract and motivate people that well, there are no patterns, it's just us? our people, our leaders, our young dynamism and our responsibility and our risk if we can achieve it. Thank you, Martin. Uh, okay, one minute each and you can take uh, uh, at, at any of the questions. Shlomo, start, please. Uh, briefly, uh, to connect was uh, the question of uh, Magda Vasaryova and an issue you raised earlier about Western democracies. I think we should be aware that Western democracies through the communication revolution are moving away from what we used to call representative democracy, where we had political parties, parliaments, mediating between the electorate and the government. Now everybody speaks in real time to everybody through, inter uh, through the social media. And this creates a kind of pressures which before that were mediated through political parties and it could be, they could be uh, condensed, they could be negotiated. Now everybody can speak to the Prime Minister, everybody can speak to the President, and therefore the dependence of the leadership on public opinion polls, which change every day, but they're also checked every day, is becoming greater. So we have, I think, a serious problem of uh, democratic uh, governance, which we have in consolidated democracies and certainly in new democracies as well. Thank you. Gregory. Yes, I, I want to make a sh short note about your question. Uh, the note is such that you were speaking about the people who want results now. So, and I have a very big example when the people have enormous 
growth of the real incomes in last five, seven years, and the social and political consequences are negative. So, my message is, if you are not changing mentality, if you are not changing social life, if you are not changing the way of connection between people, and you have wonderful economic results because of the prices on oil or gas or whatever, at the end you have a disaster. You have no positive developments at all. This is the question about now and speed of reform. This is why the main thing is the changing the, the society and as a result of that, the growth of the well-being, not vice versa. Well, if Václav Havel would be here, he would say, ain't them paradoxes, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I do think the rising expectations exist, and uh, probably there are certain danger. Uh, but uh, I do think one shouldn't uh, see them as too great. It's, of course, true now, when suddenly people can travel around the world. Um, till uh, two generations ago, it was practically impossible uh, to emigrate from a country. And uh, till 25 years ago, the frontiers were closed, and you couldn't cross the borders. Now, if everything uh, is open, the temptation exists. People will realize that uh, the emigration is not as easy as that. And the, they won't be as successful as they think when they come to states or other country. <coughs> so I think this fashion uh, will pass and, and uh, people will detect the charm of their own country too. Don't be afraid too much of this. Expectation on the other side, give energy, uh, mobilizing people and so on. So the, the expectation has the positive uh, side too. Uh, don't be afraid of too much of this. What we are, uh, what uh, we am more afraid of, that we are bored by democracy, especially the young people. We and this is one of the reasons why all over Europe you suddenly see jumping up this uh, rather ghastly uh, radical movement who take up the symbols of a awful past and working with them and. In a limited way, they are successful. It, democracy seems to bore young people. It is not attractive. We see it in the political parties that very few young people enter politics. Uh, they think it's, it's, uh, it's a really obscene job and uh, not interesting. And I think that's a much bigger danger for us. Nobody is interested anymore to enter politics from the young people. Well, Kari, with all due respect, you know, I have to say a word in defense of, of young people. I think some older people are bored with democracy as well, the way I look around. Uh, Igor. Uh, just two things. I, I, I might be wrong, but I stick to my, let's say, wrong ideas. I think that, let's say, democracy Let's say the key elements of the democracy and the key elements of the liberalism is the solution for the aspirations of the most of the people and majority of the people around the world. I do think so. Uh, on the other side, I do think, let's say, that these, what we used very often, even in this panel, saying Western liberal democracy, let's say something what we in our times need to change. Let's say liberal democracy is not Western, and we need to root the concept of the liberal democracy into the multiculturalism. Let's say. We have now a lot of countries which are not Western and which are democratic, let's say, and they are genuinely democratic, let's say. So we need really kind of the, uh, a dialogue, uh, 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 we, we need intellectual work to reroot and redefine let's say, the key elements of the liberalism and the key elements of the democracy into this complex, <coughs> multipolar world uh, in which uh, we are living. And
Tarek, it will be up to you to say the famous last words, but in one minute. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do it in one minute. But on, on your point, expectations, I think the other side of the coin is leadership. And again, in the Middle East, I would say that there are all of these amazing expectations amongst the young, but I would argue not a single Arab regime is really trying to address these expectations. And the modus operandi is one of three things. Those who have money, mainly in the Gulf, are trying to buy off the middle classes. Not addressing the problems, but just buy them off. Just keep them happy with throwing money at them. Those who do not have money are trying to exclude the others, claiming that if you put us in power long enough, we will have all the answers. And we have seen in Egypt, actually, recently, in the past year or something, a model of that. Or, also in Egypt and in other countries, trying to demonize the others. So if if the others are just not there, they're horrible, they are national security threat, blah, 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 blah. But the three modus operandi are not confronting the fundamental problem, which is expectations. The good news, and I'll finalize with that one, is that those who have done some serious primary research amongst the young Arabs from the Gulf to the Maghreb, to Morocco, and passing through the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa, I think come, come with one shocking, in my view, positive development amongst those young Arabs is that they basically have lack of respect for everything that has come before them, including the elders of today, which might sound horrible, but in my view, it's actually fantastic for one simple reason. It means that they are forced, forced to come up with new paradigms, new ideas. So in my view, simply, the expectations are there. All of what's being offered right now is either ex what's the word in English, uh, escapism or demonizing the others. In my view, the solutions will not come from these leaderships, but from the young who will emerge with new paradigms. And I think we will probably hear or see some very interesting developments of ideas over the next maybe five or 10 years, but from young generations, not from, not from the current leaderships, in my view. All right. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's all we have the time for. I apologize to, to all the people who wanted to speak but didn't get uh, a chance. But I, I still think we owe our panelists a big round of applause.